Hello, I'm Amanda McKay. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Growing Exposed, the show that takes you inside the business of marijuana growing. Like many of our tours, today's garden has never been shown to the public, so I can assure you that what you'll see today is ultra exclusive. Of course, each individual garden uses unique systems and techniques, but we don't wanna just show you what they are doing, we also wanna show you why they're doing it. Now in the next garden, the why is pretty clear. The square footage in the building, well, it just wasn't there. So that's why they had to get creative. And you'll see exactly what they did to solve the space issue right after we give you a quick rundown of what else you can expect to see on this episode of Growing Exposed. And uh, we it took all the genetics we had and we crossed them all. First, we rolled the dice with some unique strains in the veg loop. Because it's just kind of a crapshoot when, you, when you're playing with genetics. David Robinson adds his helpful insights with his teachings of the garden sage. And as you know, genetics is the foundation for maximum yield. As we enter the grow room to find plants stacked to the ceiling. It ends up being just a jungle, a two-story jungle. We get let in on a tiny secret weapon against pests. If you ever see a, a normal spider mite, they're just really slow. They're probably stoned as shit all the time. Heading over to Vancouver, British Columbia to check out a product at this year's Maximum Yield Trade Show. We have uh, the professional line meters, which are fully waterproof and replaceable probe. Very easy to replace probe, like such. Wrapping up outside the grow room, viewing the finished product on the shelves. It's nice to know somebody will actually enjoy it. You know, you're, you're bringing good feelings to people. That's a good thing. Yes, it is a good thing. And so is Growing Exposed. In many ways, the people behind the next grow are trailblazers. Being one of the first facilities to be legal in their area, there were a lot of roadblocks when it came to finding a location. People were just not open to the idea of marijuana growing when they started up. So they took what they could get and they settled on a small unit in an industrial park. Now the square footage may not have been there, but they certainly had the ceiling height. So they made a decision to create double-decked racks which allowed them to place plants on two levels. Allow me to introduce you to Scully, who has worked in the garden right from the beginning and is ready now to give us an exclusive tour. This is uh, the entrance here. We built this place from ground up. We, we, there's so hard to find a place that was legally able to actually have us for a, a business, you know, because, you know, city limits, all the uh, thousand feet from a school, all the different laws that the state had to do. We had to jump through all those hoops. And being one of those first few people, it was really hard to find a place. Now it seems that everybody is like, oh yeah, just throw it here on my property. I don't care. But, you know, at first it was like, nobody really wanted you to do it anywhere. So we actually had to build our whole mezzanine area to process our product on our facility in-house. And we're starting off now kind of as small as we can and, you know, in hopes to build up in the future. Why don't we go check out our babies in here? Here's all our small babies. These ones are getting about ready to go in here. He's actually, right now, he's writing down all the plant numbers. They start off over here. Just have the basic little hydroponic guys. These ones have been in for a little bit, so they start to have roots going on them. We have about 15 different strains we run, and right now we're growing about five. Basically, when as soon as they come out of the clone machine, we go right into the two gallon pots. We let them veg for about two or three weeks, max pretty much, and then you migrate them in to flower from there. In our veg room, we just have a small three ton split system. It's uh, the other split pieces on the roof here. Um, we do our LED lighting for our uh, veg is actually they run 215 watts. So they are very ener energy efficient. And as you can see, they actually do have very strong growth, thick stalks, strong node spacing. For a 
you know, LED light in bed, that's what you want. This is actually our one of our uh, signature strains. It's the Gackleberry, the G13 cross of the skunk number one. And uh, we actually made this genetic ourselves. I grew these out on uh, the original moms. I grew them out on Lummi Island. It's got a really quick finishing time with a good yield and uh, a, a really pungent aroma. And this one's actually worked out really for, well for us. It's tested out around 28%. It's a strong indica, so, and it, so it grows nice and compact. And it's good for our system because, you know, two tall plants in a system that's stacked like ours, like you'll, you will see in a minute. Coming up after the break. Once these get going, they'll actually curl down the sides and it'll almost like come down over top of you. Now this is about an hour away from our headquarters. It's beautiful up here. Yeah, this is Pacific Northwest. This is, this is what it's all about. This is why we are where we are. We can live anywhere in the world. We can choose to live anywhere we want. We love living here. I agree. First kayaks ever in this lake, probably ever. I would hazard a guess and say first human beings in this lake. I mean, this is a glacial fed lake. We're up here to demonstrate how beautiful and how clean our water is and the environment that we have and care and protect. Every little bit of green planet nutrients encompasses this. The purest, cleanest water, the, the highest quality source nutrients. We care very much about ensuring that your plants get the best nutrition possible. All the water that we get comes from lakes and glaciers like this. One major advantage we have over every other nutrient manufacturer globally. I think green plants have a major role in the future of the industry. We're innovators, we create new products every day, and we'll be at the forefront of the movement. We're quality focused, we're result based. We have to make sure that the end user has a positive experience every single time they use a green plant product. Crossbreeding two marijuana varieties requires careful selection of the traits that you are interested in. Scully, who produced a one-off strain called Gackleberry, explained that his strain has good yields, a quick finish time, and it smells great. He also mentioned it grows short and compact, complementing the growing system that they've chosen. Now it's time to throw it over to the author of the Grower's Handbook, David Robinson, for some more insight on the role that genetics play when choosing your hydroponic system. The reason why genetics is the number one factor that goes into maximum yield is because if I take super healthy genetics and put it in a mediocre environment, in general, I still get an awesome yield. If I take mediocre genetics and put it in an awesome environment, often our results are still only mediocre. So everything starts with that genetic foundation. We all have to take the time to make sure we breed and establish the healthiest genetics possible for the good of our whole planet. Because genetics is the foundation for maximum yield, it becomes crucial that we conform our garden to our plant. We select a given genetic and we get to know it. Does it like to be big? Does it like to be small? and then we can form our garden to support that growth. Some circumstances can be very specific. In the scenario where we have double deck gardening and I select a strain that likes to be very large and I allow it to get a little bit too big in my vegetative room and put it into my flowering room, it can grow me out of house and home and I can end up in a situation where I have no more room to raise my lights. This happens very commonly and hurts yield a lot. So it is crucial. We have to really get to know our plant. We have to know what it likes for food levels. We have to consider how best to prune it. Some plants may require much more aggressive pruning than others. Some may show a much smaller yield if they are excessively pruned. Lights on temperature, lights off temperature, CO2 levels, humidity levels, all of these things play a role 
For example, some strains might like a cooler lights off temperature towards the end of the crop. These are all details that we need to learn through diligent application. If you track and record these details, you will reveal these yield enhancing patterns in your particular chosen genetic. David has incredible insight into growing marijuana. If you would like a link to his free five-part video series entitled Factors That Maximize Yields, go to our website at growingexposed.com. Plus, while you're there, you can browse through hours of bonus footage of our exclusive garden tours. Right now, let's rejoin Scully as he enters the flower room. We were on the double stacks, six foot row with another about six foot room on top. Once these get going, they'll actually curl down the sides and it'll almost like come down over top of you. And it's like, it ends up being just a jungle, a two-story jungle. So we had, you know, as you can see, we only have so much room above us to work with. And so, so we're using all of, our, all of our area we can, you know, just maximizing our space. We, we always call it spatially challenged. It's a rolling room, so we constantly have flour coming out of here, as well as constantly have new material going in there. So you have stuff that's completely finished, just about to stuff that just came in two days ago. This is one of our high CBD, CBD genetics here. This is the CBD Lily. It actually tests out at like 12% CBD and about six to 8% THC. So it ends up, you know, being more medication than and getting you stoned and stuff. But CBD effects, everybody has been kind of hip to those ones these days, so. This is one of our other signature strains. This is the salmonberry. It's the Afghani goo crossed with the blueberry. And uh, it actually will turn purple, like dark purple naturally from not, not even from being cold, just from just its natural colors just coming out in it. Yeah, these Illumitex are actually dimmable, so you can actually, they'll turn them, I'll actually have to turn them down in the last part of flowering because it'll actually be too, too strong for them. So the last like week, I'll act, or the yeah, last five days, I'll actually turn them down so it won't actually burn them. Some of those LEDs work and some of them just kind of say they work. So this is one that actually works. Coming up after the break. Before we even move plants in, they complain that they smelled pot. So you're saying I can ask this cat any question? The cat is connected to the computer. You just type in the question, it will read his mind. There the answer comes. You're the man! I've been looking for this for weeks. Although each of the growing systems we showcase are very unique, the basic fundamentals of an indoor garden still remain the same. Growing indoors, plants will need light, nutrients, and climate controls, just to name a few. So let's check out some of the gear that this facility uses to create that perfect environment as we resume our tour. We try to get as much air movement in here. Obviously, it's pretty pretty hard to get much fans everywhere. But we have them kind of sporadically throughout the room. I'd like to get some more air movement up higher. It's but it's just hard to find you know enough plugins and stuff. We double insulated our roof because I guess a lot of these buildings that are just kind of the big whole buildings, the condensation on the roof when it's hot inside and they'll uh, condense on the metal building and it'll actually rain inside the building so people have been just uh, kind of screwing up properties by doing by not properly insulating our neighbors when we moved first moved in they before we even moved plants in they complained that they smelled pot I 
have all our feeding schedule and charts on here so we know all our PPM and, and where we're at for feeding and all that. Our big AC unit that goes throughout the entire room. So our eight, we have a 25 ton train AC unit and it actually had to be structurally engineered to be put on top of the roof. It couldn't actually be set on top of the roof because it's so heavy. So we actually had to put these six inch solid steel columns, there's four of them, they go six feet in the ground with uh, a full cement truck worth of cement in each four of the pillars. If you wanna go see the, the big behemoth on the roof. So this is just a vapor barrier because our AC unit was actually, uh, it's so strong and it was actually drawing air from the back door. So we actually had to seal it up. As you can see, it'll actually suck air in and it'll keep that thing tied up against the building rather than it flapping around and stuff. We did everything we could to, to avoid showing off where we were too, and that's the biggest. But you know, we're all legal, and cops know we're here, when they know me by name. I can call them up if something's going on, and they'll be right here in five minutes. So, you know, that's the beauty of being legal. With new and exciting gear coming on the market every day, we keep you in the loop with our next segment. So to begin, I will start with uh, our newest product called the HM500 Hydromaster. It is a continuous ECPH uh, temperature meter, which has your standard high and low alarm set points. Uh, the differentiating factor from this continuous monitor and other uh, brands is that it is portable due to its rechargeable battery. Uh, so all I would do is disconnect it, uh, the power, the AC power, and lift it off from the uh, wall mount here and then go test my other reservoirs. Uh, it also has the versatility of having a bench top if you want to do that. It is extremely easy to use touch screen to go into different calibrations. I would just use the up or down arrow keys, enter what I want to go into, set my alarms. I can do uh, every 30 minute alarm, every 15 minutes, I can do a silent alarm. Tremendous uh, versatility. That's the HM500. Moving on to the handheld products, we have uh, the professional line meters, which are fully waterproof and replaceable probe. Very easy to replace probe, like such. And so again, we are a company that likes to offer uh, tremendous versatility, more features at a great price. Um, we have a about less than 1% return rate, so you know it's uh, definitely not a concern. But if uh, over time the pH probes do go down, you can just replace the probe and not have to replace the entire meter. Recently, we in, uh, changed the batteries. Any of you that might have seen before, we used to have the watch batteries. We now have a easy to replace two AAA batteries. These are just your, uh, you know, to calibrate your pH four and seven. And then uh, these guys, this is uh, your storage solution. Very important uh, to always hydrate your pH meter in a potassium chloride, not any other thing, not as, you know, uh, a GH uh, pH four seven that says electrode storage solution. It is not. It has to be a potassium chloride solution. Absolutely, that's a number one thing. Um, and luckily our meters can be resaturated, so if you kind of let it dry, you can actually bring it back to life by letting it soak for a good 24 hours. Get ready for more Growing Exposed after the break. If you buy soil from somebody, you'll get a bug eventually. So these are always a good defense mechanism for you. If you're a marijuana grower, you already know that you're not the only one who loves weed. Lots of pests do too. They find their way into the garden, feeding off the cannabis leaves and causing havoc while robbing hydroponic gardeners out of valuable crops. Skelly is about to show us how he keeps his crop free of pesticides by releasing predatory bugs to make sure he doesn't have any unwanted guests.
We have six rows with end caps to, and you know, to get our, our city occupancy, we actually had to do handicap rows. So all the rows are handicap accessible. So everything in here, you can go down with a wheelchair. And so, so we're using all of our, all of our area we can, you know, just maximizing our space. We, we always call it spatially challenged. So you have stuff that's completely finished to stuff that just came in two days ago. And that's another reason why we're running uh, beneficial pests. So these bugs are called nicknamed strats, and they're actually a, a soil mite that eats uh, fungus gnats. And basically all we do is just sprinkle a little bit of the, the bugs on the, on the surface of the soil, and then they crawl into there and they eat the larvae of the fungus gnat. Those bugs will find their way down into the soil and have a good time. People spray all kinds of non-fun things. I mean, when, I have to, when I've had to spray in the past, I've used organic oils and stuff. And that, that's okay, but it still leaves a little bit of a residue. You know, they're fairly inexpensive. You can order them on Wednesday. They'll come to you on Friday. Every time you transplant, you sprinkle a little of these bugs. They'll, any of the soil born, um, if there's any like thrips or fungus gnats in your soil, and they always come in in your soil, whether you say you don't have them at all. If you buy soil from somebody, you'll get a bug eventually. So these are always a good defense mechanism for you. And then we also have a, a few different other mites that are a predatory mite for spider mites. And they're actually a little bigger and they're faster. You, this right here will treat about half this entire room. So you just, you know, tap, tap, get a little bit in there. About a tea, teaspoon or something like that. Take it in here a little ways, put it on, on the understory of your plant. And then those guys will crawl up there onto your plant. And then from there, they'll spread from branch to branch to branch to branch, just looking for spider mites, looking for trying to devour those little, little guys. They're hungry little suckers. They're about three times as fast as the spider mites. They just cruise around. If you ever see a, a normal spider mite, they're just really slow. They're probably stoned as shit all the time. But um, <laughs> these guys are fast. They just are on a mission and they want to eat spider mites. When they die, they just go back down into the dirt and, and die off and kind of complete the whole life cycle. When it comes time for harvesting, the buds are trimmed, cured and packaged, and shipped off to the store, ready to be sold. Here's a final thought from Scully as he views the product on the shelf and admires the fruit of his labors. So we don't have a massive harvest, so we don't get overwhelmed all at once. We are able to constantly trim pretty much every day. I don't think I've put down a pair of scissors in this facility for, I think, four months now. And even then, it was for like a week. So you just go back to trimming and trimming and trimming. But it makes it manageable for two or three trimmers to actually get through an entire room, which before <clears throat> would have had to have 20 people in here for two weeks just to be able to pound through the whole room. The end result with our product is it all goes to recreational stores, and then from there it's you know distributed to the consumer. How about I take you over to one of those retail shops now and I'll uh, show you the end result of our product. So here's, we just have a few different genetics here. Right now they're down to just a few grams. I got a few eights left. Some joints. And actually we had a little write up in the Northwest Leaf a little while back. I think it's about four hours to take a pound and turn it into grams and package it up and ready to go for, for the consumer. A lot of effort goes into actually bringing it to this end. The grapefruit from uh, Fine Detail Greenway is actually specific to our company. We did grow it from seed ourselves. And it is a little bit different than, it's got a, a stronger citrus and piney flavor to it, as well as a strong uplifting high. It's nice to know somebody will actually enjoy it. I'm actually going, I'm getting, you know, I'm not just getting people high, I'm getting them medicated too, because I do the CBD genetics as well. So it actually will help people. Like I have a friend who's uh, a snowboarder for years, he broke his back. He smokes a CBD, he can actually walk around. So it's, it's, you know, one of those magic things that, you know, you're, you're bringing good feelings to people. It's, it's a good thing. That's it for this episode of Growing Exposed. If you want more exclusive content, make sure to like our Facebook page or check out our website, 
growingexposed.com. I'm Amanda McKay, and this grow has been exposed.